Oh, and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as one of the brightest minds in the British diplomatic service. He's travelled extensively and uh, served in British missions around the world, most notably perhaps as the Deputy Head of Mission in the United States. I'm delighted to welcome Sir Michael Arthur, British High Commissioner. Uh, Michael, before you uh, took office, there were these press reports of your discovery of India. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> well, very, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me onto your program. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. And it's interesting you should mention that phrase, discovery of India, because one of the most important books I read before I came here was The Narrow Discovery of India, which I thought was a, a masterpiece. And one uh, gave me great admiration, not just for him, but for what he, he wrote about. But you're right. I mean, before I came here, I wanted to get as wide as possible an experience as I could of India, because I have I've visited India, but I've never lived here before. And so as part of that, I thought I'd try and see some of the things uh, before I was High Commissioner that it's not so easy to do once you're sort of in the, in the job. Tell so us I, about the time you spent with a farmer in Karnataka. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's sort of an unusual <laughs> image of a, of a potential or a future High Commissioner <laughs> going into sort of living in a village like that. Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to see India from the bottom up as well as from the top down. Uh, and secondly, I thought that if you've got 65% of your people living in the rural area, the first thing you need to do to understand it is to go and see the rural area. So in a couple of states, so one in Karnataka and one in UP, through Indian NGOs, I was very lucky to have a week in each case, traveling around the villages, seeing some of their projects, staying with the farmers and so on. So it was um, a great privilege and I learned a huge in, amount. In what ways do you think that is, that is influencing your job and, and the way you're looking at uh, your, your, your tasks and responsibilities? Well, I think it's the way it gives you an understanding, at least a bit more of an understanding, about what makes India tick, you know, what is in the soul of, of people. Uh, I think economically it's important because, as I said, such a high proportion of your people are working in these environments. And also, if you're, if you're trying to learn, by talking to people out there in the real, real economy, talking to them and their interaction with the district uh, uh, magistrate and with the, the system, you understand a lot of how India operates. And I found it a hugely rewarding experience. Looking at India in, in, in the British relations, uh, in the last couple of years there has been a, uh, a significant increase, though not sort of visibly so, it isn't talked about as much, uh, in, in defence relationships between India and, and, and the UK. And in, in some ways that becomes a very strong indicator of the nature of the relationship between two countries because you can go through a lot of diplomatic niceties and platitudes mm. but when you begin to trust each other in some ways with, 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 the, with the military and the defence, uh, then it becomes a far stronger statement. It's certainly true. We've just had our annual defence talks, which have gone extremely well. And indeed, there, there have been a step change, we found, on some of the previous exchanges because we're both on the same sort of mindset, same wavelength about some of the big international strategic issues. And because of the way our armed forces have always operated, they understand each other quite well. I mean, we don't exchange as much as we would like to, and this week we've indeed agreed, agreed to do quite a lot of new activity over the coming months and years, which will move that up a, a notch. But you're absolutely right, this goes to the heart of confidence and trust between governments and cultures, and defence is a good place to start. Beyond the sale of uh, defence equipment and, and, and the Hawk uh, yes. aircraft is, is, is very much on the agenda and yes. sort of creeping into the news yes. despite the elections. What are some of the strategic objectives and goals of uh, British policy in terms of defence in its relationship with India? Did you mentioned, let me give you one little point from, from Hawk. I mean, it was obviously was a, a joint collaborative project which will involve our two industries. But I think one of the most important points that's coming out of that is that 75 of your pilots are going to go to Britain and train alongside our pilots. And so there will be a new human bond there and a human understanding about these systems, which is you know, much more than just the hardware and sensors there. But uh, you asked about the strategic uh, issues. Uh, the f London has had a very interesting debate over the last year and a half about uh, where British foreign policy is going in the 21st century. And we published a strategy last uh, December and we identified eight top priorities. But the key point for me and for you is that when you look at those priorities, which are defined in functional terms, 
countering terrorism, um, the, the environment, climate change, energy. Uh, India is a key partner for us if we're going to achieve the goals we've set for ourselves. And this has given rise to a huge new range of intergovernmental cooperation, plans for even more in the future, as we work with India on those global goals that we're setting ourselves. So what a new some, era in our What are some of the key features, key elements uh, of, of, of where you see India's significance uh, in, in Indo-British relations and in, in the British view of the world? Uh, and again, uh, if we could move sort of you know, beyond looking at uh, the economic issues, yes. which are self-evident in yeah. a globalized world, but what are some of the more specific areas? Well, I mean, I think the economic issues shouldn't be uh, downplayed because in a globalized world, uh, what we call economic actually spills over into much more people-to-people -people contact. And there is a huge growth in the people-to-people -people links between our two countries based on shared education and values and so on. But you may want to come back to that. that you, you asked me to look at strategies. Uh, I mean, India clearly has, given your geographical position and your uh, power and importance, you have uh, um, an involvement in the world beyond Indian shores uh, where it's important for us to be working with you in talking about the strategic challenges that we all face. And as I say, some of the new challenges in the 21st century are not even sort of country to country based. They are counter-terrorism across the world. We're all facing this terrible uh, threat. And it's only by working together that we can succeed in combating terrorism. So there's a very good example of a new joint operation. Mm -hmm. You're watching a conversation with the British High Commissioner to India, Sir Michael Arthur. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Beyond defense, uh, uh, it's, it's ultimately, it seems to be economic relations that define ultimately relations between two countries. I mean, if economic relations are, are important and significant, then countries tend to mend fences and other issues. Uh, so not that there are that many fences to mend between India and, and the United okay. Kingdom. But what are some of the significant economic uh, issues that are opening up? Well, I think this is a hugely exciting area for the next few years. I mean, of course, our conventional trade is high. It's about $10 billion a year, roughly, in balance. And that's growing all the time, which is exciting in itself. But much more important than that, uh, we're seeing signs in this globalized economy of the two economies, top companies in both economies, working together in a partnership way, which is unprecedented, really. And I give you examples of cross-investment, where um, pharmaceutical or biotech companies, I can think of examples in each country, have invested in the other country to do new research work on new drugs. The same thing's happening in the IT industry. Um, in, in the banking industry, we have down in Pune, a company, a British, big British bank, which has people working online there doing financial service products plugged into the mainframe computer in Sheffield. I mean, this is a new world, and India and Britain have skills and have affinities here, which are really exciting, and I myself want to put forward during the time I'm working in India. How serious might uh, issues such as outsourcing be uh, to, to, to the British government? It's a very good uh, question and a very big issue and our position is absolutely clear. Um, if British companies believe that it's in their uh, business interest to outsource to India and do what, whether it's call centers or now increasingly higher up the chain, value chain, we as a government uh, stand with those companies. We think that is part of the global economy and good for Britain just as it's good for India. And we are one of the most open economies in the world. We are a service providing economy ourselves. Um, so we are the first to recognize that where you've got competitive, internationally competitive uh, service skills, we should use those. And by the same token, your companies should use ours where we've got them, banking, law, and so on. So it's a win-win. It's and uh, our government is absolutely clear that the outsourcing debate, if it's good for British business, is good for the British economy. How deep and profound uh, is, is the British commitment uh, to the European Union, uh, given that on, on, on the common currency, uh, Britain common seems currency. to be holding back and, and, and the debate seems to keep cropping up every now and then. Uh, how, how, how deep, enduring and, and firm do you think the commitment is? Well, uh, I've spent most of my career working in and on European issues, so uh, they're close to my heart in terms of the substance. I mean, Britain's commitment to Europe is certainly deep and profound. And if you look at how Europe's evolved since 1973 when we joined, there's been tremendous change there. On many of those changes, we feel that we've made a leading contribution to the way that the European debate has, has matured. 
Uh, you mentioned the euro. I mean, we were, of course, part of the negotiations for the Maastricht Treaty, which set up the euro. And we have uh, we helped design it, if you like. And we've always said that um, th we may, in due course, join it. But of course, uh, before we do that, we will need to have a referendum in our country. And we've uh, set out some quite clear criteria by which we would like things to change before we put that issue to the British public. But within a you know, not too distant future, it may well be that that choice will be made by Britain. And uh, whether we're in the euro or not, we are a central part to all the rest of the economic structures in Europe. And if you're a trader, to be honest, I mean, the difference in the exchange rate is a pretty marginal factor. And the single market is the single market, and we're right there. Mm. Inevitably, when you're looking at what is essentially projected as economic union, it, it, it grows into some forms of political union. Yes. And, and, and then, in, inevitably, we were talking about the significance of defence. Defence comes into it. Yeah. Uh, how serious has been the divide between uh, the United Kingdom and uh, the European Union on Iraq, and on, on, on its partnership with the United States, uh, and, and its support uh, for intervention in Iraq? Uh, before I do, I'll come to Iraq, but just in terms of the way that the European Union is e evolving from economics through political union you, you mentioned, the word union itself is something that five years ago we uh, balked at. We're now talking about a constitution. I mean, we didn't use that language five years ago. So things are evolving in quite a, a, a significant way. And some of the policy work that we do at the European level now goes to the heart of what a nation state regards as politics. I mean, some of the social decisions and some uh, things affecting pensions and so on, you know, are things that we do as Europeans um, in some way. So there's a political element to that, which in the foreign policy area is translating into increased cooperation on uh, foreign policy and security policy. Now, where does security policy become defense policy? That is one of the debates we're having. And two countries, France and Britain in particular, who have an international defense uh, capability and, uh, and, and profile. I mean, the others do too, but I mean, we happen to have been leaders inside Europe in trying to drive forward uh, the European defence cooperation. And we're well down that path, um, uh, although of course nations still act as nation states when they commit their men, to, men and women to war. Uh, now that's the backdrop for what's happened on Iraq. We, as you know well, I mean, went into Iraq um, for reasons that were well aired at the time, but uh, within the context of a United Nations Security Council uh, resolution, a series of them actually, uh, which for us is a crucial um, overhead, a crucial uh, parameter without which we would not in international law want to deploy our troops uh, abroad. And now some of our partners uh, came with us, some of our partners in Europe decided not to. Those were sovereign decisions and perfectly fair ones based on the assessments that the governments and indeed the public opinion in those countries made at the time. But it's a changing process um, all the time. President Bush is under uh, great scrutiny, perhaps more so because it's election year, yeah. uh, on the issue of the weapons of mass destruction that were never found. Yeah. And, and there's a great deal of criticism whether that was projected as the basis, despite you know, your comment that it was the UN resolution, which many people really thought was a fig leaf, uh, that it was the weapons of mass destruction that the, that the, that the allies of the coalition went into yes. to get. Uh, do countries sort of uh, uh, commit mistakes? Do they apologize? Do they sort of step back and say, well, I was wrong? Uh, how, how do you view? Uh, yeah. Two years later, a uh, year and a half later, yeah. uh, the American, in, uh, the American British intervention in Iraq. Yeah, and others too. I mean, we, we, we were <laughs> a, 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 a coalition. I mean, as you, for, for you and those of your viewers who followed the British debate, I mean, there's been a very intense public debate about this in our own country. It's one of the healthy signs of a, of a democracy that we have this. And as our Prime Minister you know, regularly said, you, at a given moment in history and time, on the basis of the evidence that's available to you at that time, leaders have to make leadership decisions. And we uh, took a decision that we did then, well known, and have no regrets about that. And the Prime Minister has reaffirmed that he's absolutely certain that that was the right thing to do. Now, it was, of course, um, about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and we were pretty confident then that there were sufficient reason uh, to believe uh, that there were weapons of destruction to do what we did. Uh, but it was also linked, of course, to the credibility of the United Nations system and a series of ultimata deadlines and requirements laid on 
the then uh, regime in Iraq by the Security Council, which had flatantly been uh, not been met. And so uh, there was a, a wider issue than just the tackling the WMD. It was enforcement of the authority of the United, uh, United Community, United Nations, uh, through the Security Council. But I think that was an important element in the mindset of our leaders when they decided what they decided. Britain and the United States have always, uh, have certainly in recent decades, uh, historically really, uh, um, enjoyed a very close relationship. In what ways might that uh, compromise, reflect, influence your relationship within the EU? Uh, but we've had a, a particular link with the United States. Uh, we have it with other countries too. We have a rather particular link with India. We might come back to that. Um, for the 21st century. But anyway, that is a fact and is, is part of what I think our European partners recognize and we hope uh, insofar as our councils in Washington um, help tilt American policy in the way that Europeans would like, we may have some influence on in that. And by the same token for America, the fact that we are integral and central to the European debate, we hope is of use to our American partners too. So it's not a zero-sum game. If anything, it's a win-win. It's a mm -hmm. You're watching a conversation with Sir Michael Arthur, British High Commissioner to India. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Uh, you were talking about uh, the, the, the special relationship you mentioned uh, the, in, in the 21st century between Britain and India. What might be some of the, the key elements that, that you were looking at? Well, I think what is very exciting for me, having just arrived here in, in India, beginning of the 21st century, is that there's a, there's a new era in our relationship on which both of us, both sides of can, can, can now build. And we've got a volume of people-to-people -people contacts such as we've never seen before, and that's set to grow even further. I mean, last year, about half a million, uh, 500,000 uh, Indians visited Britain. About a third of a million Britons visited India. We've got one and a half million NRIs in Britain, British citizens actually, they're probably technically PIOs rather than NRIs, who have become, beyond doubt, the most successful of our minority communities, economically, politically, socially. And they are a fantastic extra bridge into this country between, between our two countries. So there's a sort of people link which is growing. Um, there's a shared values system between us for historical reasons and cultural reasons and you know, uh, obvious uh, reasons you, you, you will see. Uh, that gives us, I think, some shared interests as we move into the 21st century where the two countries, the two governments can work more and more together. In, uh, in recent decades, Britain has increasingly become a multiracial society. Yes. And as you mentioned, that uh, the Indians are amongst the most successful yep. uh, minorities. What are some of the, the techniques and strategies and approaches uh, that uh, the British government has evolved and followed uh, to ensure that this is a harmonious process, as it seems to be most of the time? Yes. Well, I'm mean, glad you mentioned that point because I mean, I'm very proud of, and I think it's quite recent that we've made this, what I regard now as successes in, in being a multicultural society. If I go back even a generation to when I was a child, we weren't then, being frank, the multicultural society that you see in London and the South East in particular, because that's where the, 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 the wide variety of people is, that you see today. Now, I mean, I think it goes partly back to our own cultural traditions. When you read Shakespeare, there's always that funny uh, scene in between the tragedies where the Scotsman and the Welshman and the Cornish person are teasing each other. I mean, there was multiculturalism back in, the, in, in Shakespeare's day. And in a sense, that's been in our bloodstream. So it, we, we are naturally sort of ready to adapt and adopt new cultures. A bit like in India, I mean, down the waves of Indian history, you have absorbed and adapted and become multicultural in a rather similar way. And I think that's quite a good bond between us, actually, and that fact of being multicultural. There are some 14,000, 15,000 uh, Indian students uh, in, in Britain. Right. Uh, British universities come into India and canvas for students. Yeah. Often there's, 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 there's concern and fear that not everybody who's coming and canvassing here uh, is, uh, is legitimate, is yes. established, and, and many of them might be fly-by-night operators. Um, the, you know, the British Council is, 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 is a major leader uh, on behalf of the British government in these areas. Uh, what is the British government doing or able to do, or what assurances do you give the many thousands of students that they that go out to Britain, that they're yes. getting a decent, legitimate education. Well, it's a very fair point. I mean, the, we, we, as you say, we do bring a lot of universities. In fact, we help bring the universities here for what they call fairs, education fairs, where they go around and show people the sort of courses they're running. Now, any of the universities that are coming under British Council, British Government auspices, you can be absolutely certain 
are bona fide good quality uh, institutions of higher learning. And they range quite widely, because some of them are quite specialised. But any of those ones that come on our trade fairs here are absolutely bona fide, and we ho hope you will agree, offer a good uh, education and a good degree. There are, of course, as in any uh, culture, there are um, people who have brass plate operations and who try and tout for services. And one of the ways that we sift that out is when uh, an Indian student finds, uh, applies to join a college which we think is not the proper college, and sometimes it's a student who isn't actually a student, somebody who wants to come for other reasons, then we, on the whole, don't give that person a visa. So we are ourselves helping protect Indians from uh, that sort of exploitation to the extent that it's a, a problem. I don't think it's a very big problem. I mean, I think the numbers you're quoting show what a huge potential there is for more education cooperation between our two societies. You know, historically, uh, you, know, you, you talked about uh, uh, reading about Indian history and, 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 and Nehru's discovery of India. Uh, most recently, a, a, a lot more recently, uh, a, a large section of people have uh, you know, felt that uh, you know, Kashmir, or the problem in Kashmir was a British legacy that they left behind. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the British position currently uh, on Kashmir and, and, and how do you view the situation? Well, we, we're watching it with great interest, and I spend a certain amount of my own time here, of course, uh, thinking about uh, the whole Indo-Pakistan relationship. But we are very clear that if there's going to be a way forward on this difficult issue, it'll have to be one that India and Pakistan themselves find the solution for. And we as the international community, and we as part of the international community, will do what we can to support uh, whatever you, you want, but we are very much uh, watching rather than doing. And so um, my, uh, my conclusion for you is that uh, this is something of great significance and we will do whatever you would like us to do, but it's the lead is with you. How, how, how problematic is, uh, is the situation? Because it's, it's in many ways it dovetails uh, with the issue of international terrorism, uh, what is happening uh, in Kashmir. How difficult does that make policy making and, and decision making? Well, um, we as a government have taken a very strong lead in criticizing all forms of terrorism. We've suffered it in our own country, so we have as much experience as, as you do in India. And when the two leaders, uh, President Musharraf and, and Prime Minister Vajpayee, agreed that Islamabad statement in uh, January with commitments on terrorism, we warmly welcomed that. And we see that as a central part of uh, a central requirement if there's to be progress on this difficult topic. You've only just begun your, begun your term here and, and at the end of it, what would be sort of two or three significant achievements that you'd like to sort of talk about and, and wave the flag? <laughs> <laughs> I would like us all to feel um, that there's been a step change in the, uh, the degree of cooperation between our two countries. I had a second point, I'd very much like to have the image of our two countries in each country modernized. I, mean, I think it is reasonably modern, but 50% you know, of your population is under 25. You're a country on the move in a very exciting way. I believe we're a country on the move. We're quite a modern society and an open economy. I'm not sure everybody in India perceives that point, and if in the end of my three years here I can have helped people realize that and see the possibilities for more British Indian cooperation in the 21st century, then that's, I feel I've succeeded. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. been Thank a you very privilege. Privilege. Thank you.